Okay, last time we were uh, finishing up on the uh, Sushrefer Heger model, and there are a couple of more comments I want to make before we go on to the, the next step. So um, we talked about you know, how we get zero modes at different ends of the sample. One thing I didn't emphasize is we have this function C, the compatibility matrix, is a function of S and S prime. And you'll recall that this is a V1 delta SS prime minus V2 delta S plus 1 S prime. Now, this is an important structure. This is actually what leads to the fact that our ability to localize the mode at one end and let it decay. This is of the form, if I write the whole matrix out now, I will have, I'll call it a C11, a C12, and then a bunch of zeros, a C11, a C12, et cetera. And remember what I have over here is psi zero, psi one, psi two, et cetera. And notice that, and it's clear from this, that we have a bunch of independent steps here. This row takes me from one to two. That tells me that you know, C11 times psi zero is equal to C12 times psi one, and put that together, and we're always moving forward. If, we had, if we'd chosen another gauge, then we would have terms over here that involve going backwards as well. And that's going to be something we're going to watch out for in our future things. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are domain walls. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Then of course I can find the spectrum. No That's correct. But uh, from the just from the spectrum, I should be able to say that uh, even the open system, there's going to be uh, there are going to be these modes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, how exactly do I see that? I mean, what is the well, exact okay, so, so if you have periodic boundary conditions, of course, you don't have a free edge. But that you have exactly what I'm going to talk about next are oh. the domain walls. Which, if you take a continuum limit of this, it's uh, called, uh, you know, it's a soliton, so to speak. It's, it's something that's localized in one place, and you can actually move it around. So let's look. Here is a domain wall. goes on and on. Now, so what we have here, remember we said there were two versions of the dimerized lattice we could have. One where we started with the single bond and the other where we started with the double bond. And so what we've taken here is to, we've, you know, normally that would be a double bond and there's a single bond here, but we've just flipped it. So we've got this guy going backwards, right? You're, you're, you're frowning. Yeah. Yes, it's the, it's the mirror image. Now we know, let, let me do this. Here we showed that there was a zero mode that was resident here without what's going on here. We also showed that if we kill this one, we had a zero mode going in the other direction. So now we can ask the question, what happens here? Well, let's think of you know, taking this like this. This has one degree of freedom that costs zero energy. So I'm going to say I have a one degree of freedom at this point, which describes the, that localized state. Going backwards, it's the same thing. So I have two degrees of freedom going into this lattice. But I have a constraint that I tie the two together. So what are the number of zero modes that I'll see there? Well, it's one plus one minus the constraint I've applied. So we can actually use exactly the same language that we used for the uh, Caladine theorem. In other words, you know, the zero mode is like the zero mode of a single point that I can move in different directions. And this guy is like putting on a constraint. So you have one zero mode localized here decaying exponentially in the two directions. Right? And then the other one I, I'm less certain about, I could come along and do this. And so now here I have another switch from one end to the other. And you can ask, well, does this guy have a zero mode? Well, it does, but it's a little more complicated. So if I start here, this is a B lattice. 
And I can decay exponentially that way if I cut this off, the zero mode there. And the same thing is true of this guy. So now, again, I have two degrees of freedom, and then I have one constraint where I lock the two of them into there, and that gives me that I have one zero mode there. But that's in the B lattice, not the A lattice. Okay. Um, now, another argument which, you know, the proof of this is um, usually done in a continuum-like thing, and it's a little bit it's a little bit nasty, actually. So you can see the proof in, in our original nature physics paper. But the net result is, and, but, but you can argue in the following way. Here, I don't have any free, free edge. I don't have any free edge. Therefore, the local count that we had, that RL, shouldn't be there. So what we say is the number of zero modes is G, where G is the outer normal to the right-hand thing dotted into RT1 minus RT2, where this is the one side and this is the two side, and divided by 2 pi. Now, you, I say you can derive this rigorously. The answer, of course, is that RT1, remember, was equal to minus A, we calculated. RT2, going back the other way, was 0. So this thing is indeed equal to 1, as it should be. And so as I say, you, you, there's a more sophisticated formal proof, which would I couldn't even get right if I tried to do it right now. But, but you can look at it in our, in our paper. Still frowning. You bought it? <laughs> And then these things, these kings, yeah, what? Oh, so, so remember, we, we had the topological, we chose the unit cell that was this one. It had that. And we said that's going to be our reference unit cell. We calculated the R, the polarization, for this cell, right? And so we call that RT1. Now, here we need what RT is at this side when it's pointing backwards. And we found that RT is actually zero for going this way. But there was a different R RL. So here, this, this guy is minus 2 pi over A in the x direction. That's the outer normal of the reciprocal lattice vector this way. This guy was minus a, and a was in the ex direction. So you see, you multiply it together, divide by 2 pi, you get 1 when that guy is 0. So to satisfy you, go read the full proof of how this is done. Now, I should say that um, you know, the model I presented here is actually not as sophisticated as real polyacetylene is, because I've assumed I only have nearest neighbor forces, et cetera. So you could ask the question, you know, suppose I had an interaction between this guy and that guy. Do I still get the same behavior? And it turns out for the polyacetylene, you do. It's, it's the symmetry that's important here. Uh, whereas in the, you know, the mechanical models I've been looking at, if I add next nearest neighbor forces, I'm out of the regime where I have a topological protection. Uh, no. Well, it, it depends on how you terminate, right? So if I, if I take a, a lattice that looks like this, excuse me? On the ring. Oh, on the ring. Um, let's see now. No, th this, uh, okay, so, so I have to draw a ring to see how we're going to do this, huh? Yeah, so I think that I, I am sort of forced to have the two kinds. That, that, that I've, you know, I've, I've moved a bond away from here. I need to put it somewhere else. And so I've got both this one and, 
and this kind that appear, right? Now, I haven't, I haven't done the counting for, for, certainly for the mechanical models we've been looking at. If I put in a domain wall that has zero modes in it, then the count is that I have to have another domain wall that has, is a self-stressed domain wall, and it's basically that that's happening here. In, in fact, so I, I'm not going to have time to go through this, but, but we have a, a one-dimensional mechanical model that exactly replicates this, where the mapping is that the A sites become the sites of the mechanical lattice, and the B sites here become the springs of the mechanical lattice. Okay. Um, fine. Now let's see, I was, I had a couple of notes to myself as to what I wanted to mention here before I went on. Excuse me. Well, if we're talking about that model, yes, that's, you know, it, it's a Pyrrhal's uh, transition and you get a different spring constant, uh, you know, depending on that. Uh, comments. Okay, I think that. Uh, oh, and I just want to remind you that, again, because we're going to see this again, that all of this says that, you know, this function, which we called N0 of G, which is the number of zero modes that I, um, well, that, well, let me write this down. So, This function right here really could have poles in it. Depends upon which, you know, what I've chosen, but I, I could ch have choose a unit cell that has poles in it. But when we go to the n prime, which is on the surface, we have g of q, c of q. I'm doing c of q. And then we have here e to the minus i q dot r t plus r l. And, you know, there could be another analytic e to the i phi here. It doesn't matter. There's a part of this that wraps around, and then you could have a part that doesn't. So that, that sort of goes away in our analysis. So this guy is the one where we've constructed a function that only has positive powers of I to the e to the i q a going away. And it's that that allows us to say that this is counting the number of zeros and not the number of, of poles. Now, if you turn it around and look at the states of self-stress, then it's the other way around. You want it to e to the minus iq. You're, you're counting the poles, so to speak. OK, so this provides most of the language we need to look at the general cases. But there are a few other things that happen. So I'd like to look at another model now, mechanical graphene. Now, you know, graphene is a very famous lattice now. It has these hexagons. And it has Nobel Prizes associated with it and all of that. It's the honeycomb lattice. And, you know, it is actually this lattice that launched the uh, topological insulator revolution because it was on dealing with models on this lattice with not only hopping between bonds, between sites, but uh, spin orbit interactions and things like that, which opened up gaps in a funny way. Um, so this is a lattice that you see a lot of. And it has interesting properties if you strain it, take a hold of it, and you stretch it. So you, know, you have a series of hoppings here. Uh, see, I'm going to do this. I mean, normally you say all, all of these hoppings are the same, and that gives you one, one theory. But if you stretch on it, then you know, you'll change the, the hoppings on these, ladder, the, these uh, bonds, but not those. So what we're going to do now is to introduce a mechanical model that exactly reproduces the electron spectrum of the stretched graphene. And you know, I don't know if any of you know Kataev and you've read any of his papers, which are incomprehensible, even the most brilliant the first time around. He plays with that model and produces all kinds of exotic quantum states and potentials for quantum computing and all of that. Anyhow, here's the model. So this model has two, is a two-sub-lattice model. 
or two site sublattice. Uh, yeah, A. Let's see, I think I, I think we're calling these the A lattice and these the B lattice, etc. So we're going to take this lattice and we're going to put a triangle down, an equilateral triangle, so that the center of mass or the centroid of the triangle lies on the B lattice and the sites. The, I mean, the, the vertices lie on the A lattice. So you get something that looks like this. I could go further. And so forth. It goes on and on again. So this is the A sub lattice, and down here, the centroid, which is, this is the B sub lattice. Uh, in units of this whole thing. This is one-third of the way from the bottom, and this is two-thirds of the way up there, like that. Okay. So we've got this, and now we are going to uh, tie the vertices together, and we're going to do one of two things. Well, one of two things. We are going to locate another point right here, which we'll call RP, it is the uh, fulcrum point. We're going to tie that point down, and then we ask what happens if we allow the vertices here to have the degree of freedom that they can move outward, so they can have a Z component. So if you think of these as being a piece of metal, and you start moving the edges up and down, you can either move the edges so the thing rotates about the fulcrum so that the, it, the Triangles remain planar, and that doesn't cost any energy. But if we move it so that the, you know, the top goes up a little further than the, the other ones, then you actually bend the object, and you create some energy. So, or there's another way of doing it, which is harder for me to draw. You put, you attach, you know, looking in the third dimension, I have this point, and I'm going to attach a spring to it, like that. And now the same thing applies. If you rotate this thing so it remains planar, you don't have any energy cost. But if, if you don't, then you'll move it up, and you'll stretch the spring, and it'll cost me energy. <laughs> this, is the, this is the point RP I, I've attached. I either you know, attach this to a frictionless fulcrum, so that, and, and I worry about bending thing. That, that's the easiest one to think about. But it turns out that it's actually non-trivial to calculate the energy uh, associated with taking the three sides and bending them upward. It's, it's even if I just give you the, you know, a simple elastic medium, it's tough. So this, this one's easier to think about. So you can show that the following object Oh, I didn't tell you. I, okay. I didn't tell you what this is. RP Okay, yeah, now I have to provide some geometry to explain what we're doing. So we're going to take our triangle, and we're going to look from here. We have a vector d1, a vector d2, and a vector d3. And so we can locate the positions of the uh, vertices by giving these, these numbers. And we have the uh, fundamental translation vectors of this lattice. We have an a1 this way an A2 this way, an A3 this way. And just for further use, I'm going to write over here what those are, because we will be doing several steps with it. So. A is the, int is the uh, distance between sites. So this, this length is A. And we can write D1 is A over root 3, 0, 1. D2 is A over root 3. And it has a minus root 3 over 2 and a see d1, d2, and a minus 1 half. And d3 is a over root 3 times plus root 3 over 2. 
and a minus one half. Then a one is a times one zero. A two is a times minus a half root three over two. And a three is equal to a times minus a half minus root three over two. Now there's one other thing that I will need. Did I write it down here? I'll have to get it. Yeah. I'm going to need the reciprocal lattice vectors. So B1. So remember, um, let's see, B1. A1 is 1, 0. A, 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 A is, this is A1, this is 1, 0. Right. 1, 0, right. Um, Look, I'm just going to call here b1 is 4 pi over a times d3, and b2 is equal to 4 pi over a d1. And these have the property now that bi dot aj is equal to 2 pi delta ij. If, if I've gotten that wrong, we'll correct it in a minute. It's, uh, it's two, this is two-dimensional. Uh, yeah, well, it's the, the uh, equilibrium is two-dimensional, but the degree of freedom is one degree of freedom per site, which is the movement up and down. I, I'm not, well, I, I have not, but I'm going to start to right now. So now, remember, I explained how how these things, how you change the energy by moving it up and down or bending it, right? And so what you can show is that um, if you have the Z1, Z2, and Z3, so this would be 1, 2, and 3, and you have, uh, no, I'm sorry, I guess this would be 1, 2, and 3. Um, so if this, it, so the, the, here, if you look at this for a single triangle, where z1, z2, and z3 are the vertices, this operation corresponds to just rotating planar, the thing, so it costs no energy. So what we then say is, well, we can assign an energy to the bond, which is just one half some elastic constant times eb squared, okay? So our energy, our Hamiltonian, if you wish, is sum over b, one half k, e b squared. And now we can, once we've got this, we can play the same game that we played with the, uh, you know, the, the, the mechanical things. I'm going to introduce a tension, t b, a t rather, t sub, uh, let, me do, let me do this the, so I don't make a, a mistake in the, uh, Okay, so I should say that we want to now remember that the center lies on the B sub lattice, and that, so the B sub lattice is what can, contains the triangles, okay? And the A sub lattice is what, is what contains the sites. So we want to know what T of uh, lattice site RB is. Well, it's going to be K times E of B. E of RB, maybe make it write it like that. Okay. And I can then ask what is the force on site RA? And that's going to be, uh, so, so this is equal to dH dEB. And this is going to be dH dZA. And that this is equal to sum over i x i z of r b plus d i. Okay, so that that's giving me. See, we have. Uh, let me make sure I got this right now. The 
I didn't write this, I didn't write this quite right. This should be ZB of, this should be ZB of RA minus DI. So we have exactly now the same structure that we had before, where we can think of these as being the tensions, and these are being the forces, et cetera. So I can define a uh, lattice. I, the, you know, I can write E. This is a set of stretches is equal to C times Z. Z is now the set of all of the upper displacements, and E is the set of all of the bonds. And I can write. Um, I can write F as being Q times the tensions. And we can write out what C and Q are. Did I write it down here now? Uh, yes, okay, here we go. Here we have C of RB RA is equal to sum over I xi delta of rb plus d sub i ra and uh, q of ra rb is equal to the sum over i of x sub i delta of ra minus d sub i rb just by, by going through all of that. And we can look at the Fourier transform. So C of Q is X, well, sum over I, X sub I, e to the I Q dot di, and Q is the, is the complex conjugate of it. So now we have exactly the same structure that we had for polyacetylene, but it's on a two-dimensional lattice, and the question is, uh, what is the phase diagram? How do we write the energy and everything? Well, the first thing to observe is that we can write this energy or the Hamiltonian as a, in terms of, uh, you know, the same matrices as we had before. This is K over 2N, sum over Q, uh, sum over Q, uh, E of Q squared. Right, which is equal to 1 over 2n sum over q z of minus q um, d of q z of q and d of q is the same thing we had before it's k c star c dagger this time c because it's it's just a scalar and um, you know we can reproduce this form by introducing an H of Q, which is omega zero, zero, C star of Q, C of Q, zero. And if we square this, we get what D is. So, so if, I, if I take H transpose, or complex Hermitian conjugate H, we get omega zero squared, C star, C, And uh, omega zero is the square root of k. So now we have a structure which is exactly the same as we had for the polyacetylene. And we know what our uh, eigenmodes are. We have omega q is plus or minus, plus or minus magnitude of c of q. And now rather than having just uh, one direction in the problem, we have these three directions in the problem, and it's arithmet arithmetically a little more complicated, but it's exactly the same idea. And so you can have regions where you're totally gapped, where this thing has no zeros, or you can have zeros that lie inside the, uh, the band for, to get wild file points and so forth. So what we're going to do now is to look at the, you know, what the various re regimes of this are, where we have zeros and where we don't. Were you going to ask a question? Okay. Uh, 
So, okay, I mean, I, the, we don't have, I mean, this thing has the lattice of graphene, but of course the, the, the physics is, is different, but the spectrum's the same. Oh, oh, I added this bond, yes, the, 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 this, this guy. And so it turns out that these X1, X2, X3 map onto T1, T2, and T3 of the graphene. So, so if you stretch, stretch graphene, you'll make your hoppings have T1, a T2, and T3, different values, and they map one-to-one -one onto X1, X2, X3. So, so that, you know, th this guy has a broken symmetry too when I stretch on it. This has a broken symmetry, which comes from wh where I put that guy. That's correct, yeah. So in, in the example where I put a spring underneath, it's really just the stretching of the spring that comes about. So as long as I move my thing like that, nothing happens. If I move it so that you know, it comes up a little bit more on this side than that side, then it, it's just the spring stretching. And if you, you know, our paper, which I think I've listed in the, uh, in the material we've given you, goes through those operations. Well, so, so, so the one with the spring, it's whatever the spring constant I put in there is. The bending, of course, depends upon the thickness of the layer and things like that, but it's basically, you know, the, the elast elastic constant is, um, you know, you want the bending modulus kappa for the beam, and, and it has, a, you know, the shear modulus times some length, and then there's a lot of geometry to get the uh, boundary conditions right and so forth. So it's a messy calculation. But, but the order of magnitude... Uh, one of those plates, yeah. plates. Yes. What will be the weight? <laughs> well, it depends on whether I make it at a micron size or, or a centimeter size. I don't know. It, so you it, have it, actually made some samples? No, no. I would love to have somebody do it. Oh. No, no. We're, we're working on trying to find someone who would actually do this. I mean, I think it would be a nice experiment. It's, it's not totally trivial, but you know, certainly people have done it. I showed you in the, in the talk on Monday these systems where they, they cut holes in it, and those they can vibrate fairly easily. So I think this is not beyond modern technology. We, we actually submitted a proposal to, uh, I guess it was the DOD about this, and they, they sent us away. So we're, we're, we'll have to wait until something else happens. Well, of course, yeah, I, I'm obviously, this is a, you know, it only works in the linearized limit because if I pull them up too far, then there's a stretch in this direction and I would have to design some special way of dealing with that. But, you know, you, you could see the effect by having a, a very small up and down, you know, I could have a, you know, I, I have something that's a centimeter on the side and I could let it go up a micron and that would be enough to see, see the, the effect. So I, I don't, yeah. Um, Okay, so we are going to introduce vial points. I must say that, that uh, in the electronics literature, it's a little confusing what they call these things. We're calling it vial points because there's just a single thing coming in. The Dirac point is supposed to have two bands that are coming in at once. Um, so this is where we have omega of Q equal to zero for Q in the Brill 1 zone. In other words, these are not edge points. These are actual ones. So I want to know when is omega Q equal to zero. So what we will have, first of all, if there's a Q star such that omega of Q star is equal to zero, there's also a minus Q star. And that's pretty clear, you know, looking at this function there, that if, if, you, have, if you have a Q, there's a minus Q that also works. Um, so let's look at the, at the point where the x1, x2, x3 is one-third, one-third, one-third. That corresponds to being at the center of this guy, right? R remember how you measure these, these x's. This, this is the line x1 equals zero. This is the line x2 equals 0. This is the line x3 equals 0. So this point is one third of the way up this way, one third that way, and one third that way. And we have this constraint that x1 
plus x2 plus x3 equals 0. Okay. So what happens if I look at the point x1, x, excuse me? The sum is 1, yes. So here, did I write 0? Oh, it, well, we'll just multiply times, uh, yes. I had a ha habit of doing that. The sum is 1, absolutely. Uh, which means now I can look at omega of q is equal to 1 third times e to the i q dot d1 plus e to the i q dot d2 plus e to the i q dot d3. And we want to know, is there a value of q for which that's equal to 0? And the answer is yes. q star of k equals 4 pi over 3a e sub x does it. And I should draw the Brill 1 zone, which looks like this. The center. Here are the, here are the points k. Now, now you might ask, why haven't I called this k1, k2, k3, k4? The reason is that these two guys are separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, and under periodic boundary conditions, you identify them with each other. So there are only two points that are distinct, the minus k and the plus k. And so what this says, that if I sit in the uh, phase diagram, uh, let's see, I need to draw the phase diagram too. Now this is going to be a little complicated. Can everybody see over here, or this far? Uh, I want to draw the phase diagram. So this is the x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 0. And we're asking what happens if we sit at, right at that point. And what there is a 0 if you lie at qk or minus qk. So these are the points which correspond to the direct points in the graphene electronic structure which is the standard one where you haven't stretched everything. Uh, and you, know, you have a legitimate zero there. Now, we have continuity here. So in the vicinity of this point, if we have vial points here that, that sit at that thing, then we have to have vial points as we move away from there a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so I want to look at the, uh, move away from here, I should say. So, so as, as, if, as I move out this way, there's certainly a finite region around there where I have vial points because they don't go away automatically. Uh, but eventually we lose them. So um, they have to disappear when the points join together. So you have this point. There's a vial point there and a vial point there. How is it that these guys can come together and annihilate? Well, if we have one of them is q star, and there's a minus q star, and we want to make to identify these. Well, they become identified if they're separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, which is one of these things. Okay, so we can solve this and find out when when that disappears, and it is when q star is equal to four pi over root three a times zero one. That's what we get. Um, just. Yeah, so, so, so this, this is where a Q star can be, and they, those correspond to these points here. So we have, um, you know, this is, this is a QM1, Q, well, QM, I, I forgot what the order is, but, but, but there are QMs. And so what happens is as we start moving around, this guy will move around and hit there, and this guy will come around and hit here, and these two points are a reciprocal lattice vector apart, so they annihilate. Um, okay, so let's look at a particular example then. Let's, what is C of Q in these points like this? So um, 
sure I state this correctly. Yeah, so let's, uh, where's my eraser? I lost it altogether. But I had a nice eraser somewhere here. Did I put it over here? Oh, it fell. This is the one that seems to work the best. So let's look at C of Q equals E to the I Q M1 dot D1 uh, X1 plus E to the I Q M1 dot D2. And Q, what the Q M J star, I'll leave out the star, is 2 pi over root 3a dj. So, you know, we've defined the directions here, which means that, you know, we're in reciprocal space now, but uh, this is, remember, proportional to one of the b vectors, which means you're, when you're in reciprocal space, it works, and there are the three different directions. So, what is c of q for that form? It's x1 e to the 2 pi i over 3 plus x2 plus x3 e to the minus i pi over 3, which is equal to e to the minus i pi over 3 times, uh, how do I want to do this? I want to write this as x1 e to the i pi plus x2 plus x3, and we want that to equal 0. So we have x1 minus x2 minus x3 equals 0, and x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1. And what that tells us is that uh, x2 plus x3 is equal to 1 half. And x1 is equal to 1 half. Okay, so if we go back to uh, this picture, right, this is supposed to be my phase diagram. So this is the point x1 equals 1 half. And as x2 plus x3 spins along here, you move along this point. So what we found is we've gone to having a zero point, a zero vial point here, and we come up to this point, and we find that there is a line here where we have zeros, and what's going to happen is over on the other side we're gapped. So this was, of course, this is just for the x1 direction, but we have the three directions, so what we have is a curve like this, and we have vial points throughout this region. Now what happens when we go up there? Well, let's look at the point x1 equals 1. So then c of q is just e to the i q dot uh, d1. And this I could write as magnitude c of q e to the minus i q dot RT. So if we use this, this unit cell and the way we're doing things, you know, notice what we've done here is we've chosen really the most symmetric unit cell we can have. We've put the center of the B lattice at the center of the triangle, and we've then repeated that. So that, that's the, the sort of natural one because it's the, it's the unit cell that reflects the symmetry of the lattice. But it's not the unit cell that we're going to use when we get to look at what the surface states are. But that, uh... so what does that tell us? That tells us that we have RT is minus I 
D1, minus D1, rather, and just read that off, that this was the definition of RT, this is what C of Q is. We could have gone through the whole operation of evaluating the contour integrals, but it's clear that, that this is what we have. Um, and then you can go and look at various other uh, versions of it. For example, um, let's see. Suppose I look at x1 equals 0. Is that what I want to do? No, I want to look at, shoot, I hope I haven't lost all of this. I may have to, you know, zip and look at, so if I, x1 equals 0, that's, that's right here, and x2 plus x3 equals 1. So what that allows us to do is to move along here, but I, in particular, I could look right at, at that point, which is a, that would give me that c of q Let's just, let's just make this be x2, that each of these is equal to a half. So this would be e to the, uh, e to the i q dot d2 plus e to the i q dot d1, q dot d3, rather. And that's equal to 1 half e to the minus i q y a over root 3 times the cosine of one-half qx a. And this is equal to zero for qx a equal to pi over two. And it's true for each qy. So what I'm going to do, let's see how many, how much time do I have left here, is it? 37 minutes. So in a couple of minutes, I'm going to pull up the um, computer and show some more pictures. So I, what, what I'll show you are pictures of zero modes that are associated with this sort of thing. So this is true for every qy, which means that I have a mode for essentially every line. Uh, and of course, here, the, the, the zero mode that corresponds to this, this is one that fills the all of space. But in any event, what we find then is here we have an RT that points down. That's just what we did there. And in every one of these, we have a different RT. So what we find is that there are regions where there are vial points. What happens is we uh, get closer and closer over. Well, actually, as I come down here, what happens is the penetration depth gets longer and longer, and uh, then eventually you convert yourself into uh, to, uh, vial points, which come off the endpoints, then move back to the Ks as I move down here. So that takes care of how to do the bulk. What about the edge modes? Well, what we want to do is the same thing we did before, and that is to choose unit cells which are compatible with the particular surface we're looking at. So in order to calculate the, uh, the, the zero modes with a surface that runs along here, what we want to do is to take this point and move it down to there. And then I've got a point that lies right on the edge, and then we have that the C of Q is equal to magnitude C of Q e to the minus iq dot rl plus rt. And in this case, rl is equal to, um, well, let me just see, did I, oh, I'm going to get the, possibly get the sign wrong here. I forgot to write this down properly. Um, rl, I believe, is, It's minus one half d1, I think it is. What, what I'm supposed to think of is, I'm supposed to think of this as being a positive charge, 
a, a negative charge, and this is being a positive charge. So you know we have one on the large system. I've got as many of the A sites as the B sites, and I can assign them a charge. And if I make this be a plus one charge and this be a minus one charge, then the average dipole moment here is half is whatever this distance is right here. So, so it's it's a it's a yeah it, it, it's a half of d one. And what what should happen now is when I do this combined with that R T, the C of Q that I look at will only have a positive e to the i q y coming out because it's going upward. So um, that arithmetic is what I sent you. I, I hesitate to, I thought I had written it down here. But what I'll do is pull up the, the slide and I'll correct this in just a moment. But you can see now we have all of the, you know, we've built all of the structure we need to understand how to look at, understand what the topological properties are when we have vial points and how to, to deal with uh, the surface states where we have a, we choose some unit cell that is convenient for studying the bulk. We just call that the, the basic one. But you know, I can have many, any different unit cell. The physical properties won't change if I change the unit cell. But it allows me to you know, restrict things so that I only have e to the plus IQY from here, e to the minus IQY if I'm coming from the top, et cetera, which guarantees me that I have a decay. And throughout the whole thing, I have this property that the C breaks. Once I've done this transformation, C breaks up into this sort of a, a matrix that I drew before, where we only have things in the forward direction. Now, so far, we've only looked at things where the C is a scalar. But when we do the, you know, the topological lattices like the, the distorted uh, Kagame lattices, these things are matrices. But it's still true you set things up so that the, this guy only connects bonds and sites within the, the surface unit cell. And this connects bonds and sites in the surface unit cell to the next one inward and so forth. And that guarantees me again that I will only see zero modes there. So can I have the screen now? Hello, hello. He, 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 said, he said I should just shout at him, and he would. Yeah, it's coming. There we go. OK, first let me uh, have a look to make sure that I've got those things right. Surface. Yeah, I had it right. So, so it's the, the um, RL could be a half D1, R2, or, or R3. So, so there's, there's a, a plus sign there instead of a. Plus a half D1. Or D, see, see, it's either a half D1 or D2 or D3. It doesn't matter because I have to, I want to dot it into the outer function and they all give the same value. Okay. Go. Okay, so I'm going to take care of a few loose ends. Um, you know, we could spend several more days just doing the uh, the uh, topological lattices, but let me go over a couple of things first. So we discussed guest modes, and I showed you 
the guest mode that comes with the, the Kagame lattice. So here is a, the symmetric twisted Kagame lattice. And what I'm going to do is change the distance. I'm going to squeeze the distance on the horizontal axis together, and we're going to watch what happens as the thing distorts, keeping all of the bonds fixed the same size, uh, you know, it's the same length. So where is my cursor? There it is. Okay, so now we're squeezing the bottom. Look what happens. Shrinks in all directions, and when I go back the other way, it's like this. Now, I have these parameters which will allow me to change from one uh, structure to another, and in particular now I can go and do some distortions like this. This changes the lattice, and you can see that, that we have a different behavior. Notice this one, when I first squeezed it, it grew in the vertical direction. So initially, at least, this is a system that has a positive Poisson ratio. It does what you expect. You, you squeeze it this way, and it stretches that way, or you pull this way, and it stretches th that way. And, but then as I keep on going, it comes down again a little bit, so I, I change in the process of going through there. So there are all kinds of different forms that I, you could make. Oh, shoot. See what this one does. Goes the other way. So there, the, the, each of these is the particular um, uh, guest mode for the different lattice. So they're ubiquitous. Uh, now, so I'm going to go pull up now the slides that we saw on Monday and discuss in a little bit more detail after you've seen all of this thing. I'll remind you of what I said that went over your head on Monday, and I think probably it's useful. So let's uh, look at the, um, you know, we learned that the, the, these Maxwell lattices have the property that the number of zero modes at any given Q is equal to the number of states of self-stress at any given Q, and that's spectacularly demonstrated in the standard Kagame lattice. I've got a pointer here. So this is a standard Kagame lattice where I identify these states of self-stress with each straight, you know, straight line of bonds. So there are square root of n zero modes and square root of n states of self-stress, and we see that with these uh, lines going from gamma to m in the Brill one zone. And if we look at omega versus qx and qy, we have these knife edge things that look like this. Now we've done the polyacetylene. This looks exactly like what happens in the polyacetylene when we go from the undimerized state to the dimerized state, and you get this uh, uh, gap opening up. And it's that gap that protects you know, the, the topological property that as long as you move continuously uh, away from this rotation, I, nothing happens until we go back to the uh, standard uh, Kagame lattice where you get this zero mode again, and it's no longer protected. Um, so that's property one that you should be reminded of. Oh, well, let's see. I, I guess I can go back and actually have a slideshow here, can't I, from current slide. Um, OK, then, then we went through this uh, for the uh, Agame lattice. We went through the surface thing. Now, now I should remind you that there are three sites per unit cell. So that means that there are six degrees of freedom in each cell. So, so the C's that we're talking about as a function of Q are six by six matrices. Six by six matrices instead of a scalar, but we can create a scalar that does again map the Brill one zone to the complex plane by taking the determinant of these, uh, you know, six by six matrices that, that describe the thing. So here we show that if we cut two bonds per unit cell. This thing was wrapped around initially on a torus. These two guys were connected down here. Uh, we've reduced the number of constraints by two. In the case of the Kagame lattice, we also reduced the number of states of self-stress by two because this point has two lines coming out that are now broken and no longer support the stress. 
Uh, so you don't get anything new when you do the cut in the Kagame lattice, except for the choice of wave numbers. Down here in the, in the twisted Kagame lattice, now we've cut the same number, but we haven't killed any states of self-stress. Actually, we've killed one overall, but that one's unimportant. So we have to have uh, N, delta NB, which is two bonds per unit cell that have been cut, of zero modes, and they reside on the surface. Those are our surface modes. Uh, and when we look at the surface mode that came from the Kagame, the twisted Kagame, which is an isotropic uh, C, you know, C3 symmetry, then uh, we, the long wavelength limit of that is that of a triangular lattice. And we know that the triangular lattice, I should have said this, the triangular lattice in the long wavelength acts like an isotropic lattice. Anybody know why? The square lattice doesn't. The square lattice does not have full rotational symmetry, but the hexagonal lattice, as far as the elasticity is concerned, acts like an isotropic lattice. Anybody want to take a stab as to why that's true? Well, what we have to do, there's no new fourth rank tensor that you can write with the directions of a six-fold lattice. You know, you, you, but on a square lattice, you can make a new fourth rank temper, fourth rank because you can take sum over the directions one and two of, you know, ex1, ex2, ex3, ex4, and that's different from the things that come from the delta functions. If you do the same thing with the six, six in a row of a hexagon, uh, four in a row of a hexagonal lattice, you get, you go back to the unit operators. So anyhow, it's not surprising then that as we go down to q equals zero, all of these lines, which are the penetration depths, is a function of uh, surface wave number, asymptote to the form that you have in an isotropic lattice. So this slope was calculated was exactly the result of the calculation that we presented on the zero modes uh, on Tuesday, I guess. On, on the, uh, not zero modes, but, but the surface Rayleigh waves. Um, now, this guy we started off with, we uh, define a unit cell, which is a symmetric unit cell. So we take the triangle, and what I usually do is we add this line, this line, and that line. I'll show you that more in a moment. You, you choose a symmetric unit cell, and you calculate RT. And RT is 0 for this guy. And you don't find anything interesting topological unless you do something else. So what we did is to straighten out these lines in one direction so that we pass through a point now where we have zero modes running along here. We no longer have the protection that you're going to qualitatively have the same behavior when you cross this line. And then we come down to over here, and uh, you look at the spectrum, and you know these dark lines right here, th th this is an intensity thing. You know, the, the, the darker the line, the smaller the frequency. That, that corresponded to zero modes running along here because we have these states of self-stress running in the perpendicular direction. Here, these look like this, but if you look more carefully, they have a dispersion where omega goes as q squared instead of omega. And you'll recall we derived that result uh, from the elastic limit just by looking at what the zero mode of the pure elastic thing was and converting it to a q thing. Um, and here, this is just to show you that even though in polyacetylene you can argue that what was important was the symmetry change, here I can construct lattices, all of which have P1 symmetry, and only this side here has a well-defined uh, topological RT defined in the way we've done it. And you know the way we define this is exactly the same way we did for the uh, uh, polyacetylene and for the honeycomb lattice here, except that we use the determinant of Q instead of just the single scalar that we had before. And now over here, this guy actually has one. And notice that th this thing has a P1 symmetry, or uh, at least a P1M symmetry. And so there is a well-defined geometrical direction. And it turns out to coincide with the direction of the uh, topological thing. Now, unit cells. So there are many ways you can define the unit cell. One is you could just take. Uh, this site, this site, and that site, and put it in there, and then put the six bonds to be the one that run around the hexagon. And uh, we would actually use that in some occasions, but I've found this one to be the most useful in a sense. So here we have 
three sites in the cell, and then we have three uh, and three bonds plus bonds that stick out. So the three bonds in the middle connect sites within the same cell, and the outer bonds connect sites in one cell to the next cell. Okay. So this guy is what we use to calculate the RT, you know, using exactly this thing. And this, uh, you know, this actually has some poles in it. So the number that comes out to calculate the RT, if I use this last thing, is something that you know, could not be used to calculate what goes on at the surface. So here now is a surface like this. Here is a unit cell that has no bonds sticking out and connecting to the to this, uh, cells below it. And so what did I have to do to go from here, from here to here? Well, you can see that this part is the same. That's the same. This guy's sticking out, but this one is here, and it's not up there. So what we had to do was to take this bond and move it over to there. And so the RL that goes with this is precisely the lattice vector that takes me from there to there. And I forget which one that is. It's A2 or one of them, right? So, and, and if you then look at the, at the uh, form of the uh, uh, Q that comes out of here, it indeed only has positive powers of E to the I Q Y coming up this way, which guarantees us that we only have zeros. And in this case, case there's only one zero because we only have, uh, in, in this lattice, we only have one uh, zero mode per unit cell along this surface. Now, if we go to the other side over here, then we have a different unit cell. And you know, if I cut it like this, then the unit cell, you know, we have three sites that are on the edge and six bonds that look like this. And then over the other side, we have a different thing. And because of the, the different shape of this unit cell, we actually have uh, a total of four zero modes per unit cell distributed on the two sides. And if we take the topological one, we, how do I go from this lattice to that lattice? And at this side, we can arrange it to have the total of four modes per, zero modes per unit cell. And you can see, what do I have to do? Well, this site, let's see. This site and that site are the same. This site and that site are the same. But this site, we had to move over to uh, here. So what we've done here is we've, we had to do two translations. Translations of bonds and translations of sites. And when we get done, we get a uh, unit cell that has only the, all of the points in it are on the edges and all of uh, on this edge and all of the bonds on the edge. And we have only couplings that go in that direction. And once we've got those uh, uh, Cs that reflect the surface symmetry, we can just uh, calculate by, by looking at the zeros of the determinant of the C matrix, we can actually calculate the penetration depths. And that's what we've done here. You know, this corresponds to this arrangement. RT is along the G. So that means that RT on this side is large. And then there is a, an RL that goes with this translation, which was also A. So the net effect is that on this surface, we have two uh, zero modes per unit cell. And they're shown here. Notice one of them comes in with a Q squared slope. And that we could have told already from the uh, elastic limit that we looked at, where we found when the determinant of G was negative, we had uh, Q modes in the bulk that, that were zero at order Q. And in order to get anything on the surface, then we have to go to Q squared. So that's, that's something that we expected. And now these show you know, other ways. So all of these guys were calculated because we had a, a, C, a determinant C of Q that only had positive E to the I Q into the bulk. And uh, it, you know, it's really trivial. It you know, took Mathematica half a second to calculate these things. This is an interesting one where, again, we have four. Notice this guy has RT that's parallel to the G. So we have a, a larger number of, uh, of uh, zero modes because the G dot RT is larger. Here it's not as large. And what happened then was we only moved one zero mode from the other side over to here when we turned on the topology. Um, and this shows the, the domain wall business. Uh, I wanted to. Yeah, so now I'm going to escape here for a moment and go to a paper. Yeah. 
So, you know, we saw that we have vial modes in the, uh, our, our model of graphene. Here is a model which, which you know, ha deals with the phonons in exactly the same way we did for the Kagame lattice, except this one has four sites per unit cell. And what we've done is to look at the phase diagram. We fix three sites and move this guy around. So that gives us a, a two-dimensional phase diagram. And this is what it looks like. It's pretty complicated. And how in the world did I do that? There we go. Uh, so you can see we have the white regions. These are regions where we don't have any zero mo vial modes in the bulk. And we have well-defined polarizations that point at uh, 90 degrees apart or 45 degrees apart going in there. Some of these go like that. And then we have the gray regions where we have the, the vial modes. So that's the sort of a generic behavior. You can see that here, this one, we're just beginning to get vial modes coming out. This one, it's more distorted. Here are the two vial modes. They, they were coughed out of the origin, and they're moving out like that. They'll eventually hit the edge and annihilate at uh, symmetry equivalent points at the edges of the Brill-1 zone as we move that around. OK, that's what I needed from there. I think I'm just about finished here. Let me just see if there are any other things. OK, so I, I mentioned that when we go to three dimensions, uh, it seems to be generic, unless you work on it, that rather than having vial points, such as this one has, you have these lines, where, which are lines in the Brill-1 zone, where you have zero energy modes. And if you wrap, you know, you do the contour integral around these lines, just as you do contour integral around a vortex and a superfluid, you get a non-vanishing winding number for these two things. So that's, that's uh, sort of amusing. Um, oh, I guess there was one other thing I might have shown you here. Let me go back to this guy. Um, well, <clears throat> I've forgotten how to explain this well. But what happens when you have a vial mode in the, in the bulk? You can have so I go along the QX surface right here. So we've cut things, so we always have zero modes on the surface. So here, suppose we have one zero mode. And then we hit the projection of the vial mode right here. What happens is the number of zero modes jump as you go across there, because we have this closed circuit that goes around there. It counts the number of zero modes, and you have a different value on, on the two sides. So the vial mode has the effect of changing the effective number of zero modes for a given Q as you go along the lattice. And what happens is here at this point, you have a, um, you know, the, the penetration depth gets larger and larger as you get closer and closer to that point. OK. I think that I will let you go early at this point. Let me just look at one more thing here. Oh, yeah, I wanted to emphasize again, which I emphasized in the colloquium, but it's worth remembering. You know, all that we've done is to we've looked at a at a constrained subset of lattices where we don't have any restoring force for bending or next nearest neighbor forces. And you want to make sure you know how to go away from that. And so we calculated and found that you know, the difficult thing was, how do you go from having no zero modes on this surface to zero modes on this surface to what happens in any elastically stable system where on both sides you have the same Rayleigh wave. And this, we went through, it explains how that happens. And so it means that you know, for sufficiently small bending forces, there is a memory of what the um, idealized limit gives us. I should say that, that uh, these were not trivial calculations. If you look at the literature on surface states, what most people do is they, they dump it into a, a computer, and you have a bunch of lines. Some of the lines are bulk, bulk lines of omega versus q. And then you see some lines below the bulk bands. But they, they miss things like you know if you do a calculation in a finite lattice, then you have an interaction between the, the two surfaces. 
and you're not sure whether which surface the, the uh, zero mode lives on. So these were done genuinely by applying a generalization of the technique that, uh, that uh, Rayleigh did to calculate the Rayleigh surface waves in the elastic limit. We then did it on the lattice where the, where the boundary condition now is that the force on each site on the edge has to be zero. And then, you know, there was a complicated system where we had to deal with six by six matrices and so forth. But now these are really calculations for a semi-infinite system where we can go to penetration lengths that are very, very long that you couldn't do in a, in a numerical calculation. Okay, it's, uh, it says here, oh, it says I have nine hour, nine minutes and 23 seconds left, but I think that uh, I've ha said what I wanna say and I'll open it to questions now if there are any left. This is a test, you know. Um, uh, there are also like uh, Dirac points on the graphene uh, spectrum, right? So, okay. so the, in the graphene, unstretched graphene without spin orbit forces and so forth, you have the two uh, Dirac points. And there, you know, they have spin as well. So that, that's why it's Dirac instead of uh, just a vial point at the K points. So those stay there, and uh, unless you do something else, you don't get a gap. So you know what was creative about what Kane and Malie did originally was they put in a gap coming from a spin orbit force, and that that then you know they 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 knew all of this business about you have a gap and you then probably have some topological protection, and the challenge was what was the group that you're dealing with here because when you're dealing with the with the graphene, you know you have an omega of q. And rather than having a straight line, you have a cone that comes up. And then you look at the two by two, you know, all of these matrices that I was dealing with here, you know, actually, you can see it right there again, you know, it's this kind of thing. This has what's called particle hole symmetry, and you're guaranteed to have a zero energy state from that. If you start adding things out here, then you need, you know, here you can describe this guy by sigma x and sigma y, and if you put in something here, you've got a sigma z, so you're mapping then not onto a two-dimensional complex plane, you're mapping onto a sphere, and the topological characterizations are more better done with Berry phases and things like that, that this is more. Yeah, so when you have a gap, there are surface states that, that are there, and, and, and they were the ones now that they found where there was this spin locking. You know, you had the surface states. Let's see if I remember how that goes. You had something like this, and you had surface states that went like that, and you know, this was carrying spin up, and the other guy was carrying spin down, something like that, and you're guaranteed to you know you put the Fermi surface here in the middle, and it's those are the zero modes you're talking about. I had some uh, a couple of questions. So one yeah. is uh, so in all these systems, like if you introduce a little bit of anharmonicity, yeah. I mean, does do this everything sort of is kind of stable to small? Well, so this is unabashedly a harmonic theory. Right. Um, you know, if if I uh, put in nonlinearities and look at the uh, harmonic theory relative to the new ground state, it would still apply, uh, but. Basically, this is a harmonic theory, and uh, you know, even putting in temperature is, is is a little bit of a challenge. But like you said, these are mostly a kind of macroscopic systems. Uh, like right now, uh, it's not uh, like so. Thermal effects are not important in the kind of uh, well. Okay, so so the so one thing that is important is you've got these zero modes, and you can ask what happens when you turn on the temperature. What do they do to the system? Um, you know, there's there's one example. It's not exactly what you want, but it is sort of amusing. So suppose you have a square lattice, and so this lattice, you know, is unstable because it can shear, right? So so it has that that uh, guest mode, if you wish. So suppose we we put in next nearest neighbor forces with a potential. It's one half uh, a. R 
r squared plus g r to the fourth. And I look at a phase diagram where I have uh, g going this way and temperature going that way. So if we go to g equals 0 and t equals 0, we've got this unstable thing. If I turn on temperature, it stretches the lattice a little bit and actually stabilizes the system so that you still have a square lattice, but now you have a, a thermally uh, induced rigidity. And it's kind of neat because right at this point, if you look at the spectrum, you have these zero modes running like that because you have these states of self-stress that run there. And so if you'd like to understand what happens when you do this, if I make this negative, so I go down here, that's going to want to um, stretch the bonds in one or two directions. So this guy goes to either this or this. And in any given row, they have to be the same direction. But when I go from one row to the next, it can be anything. So this has a ground state, uh, you know, semi-extensive ground state entropy. And as you come out here, you have order out of disorder, which picks out one of the things. And you can, you can treat this thing by using what's called, you know, the Brzozowski theory of the transition from a fluid to a crystal. Uh, you can use Brzozowski's theory to, to do that. It's kind of cute. Okay. So I guess no other questions. Okay. So uh, I mean, so this uh, topo I think this topological mechanics is it's a really uh, new and uh, important uh, topic in condensed matter, and uh, I think Tom is one of the founders of this uh, thing. So it's really great that uh, he came all the way uh, mm -hmm. to give this set of lectures. Uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of things to think about, and at least I feel like going back and reading about this stuff uh, more. Uh, so let's uh, thank him for the lectures.